21. As I speak, Hurricane Irma has touched down and is slamming uh, the keys of Florida and entering into uh, other parts of Florida. I don't know what the damage assessment will be when it's over. I do know this follows Harvey. This follows what happened in Texas, which is still engulfed in uh, Houston and different parts of Texas. Uh, radically Corpus Christi, even, I mean, cities outside of uh, Houston. A uh, lot of stuff going on around the world. Crazy stuff. And in Luke chapter 21, in Matthew 24, and Mark 13, all titled the Olivet Discourse, because Jesus gave this discourse on the Mount of Olives just before he was crucified. A couple days before he was arrested. He wanted his disciples to know what would take place in the future. God is a good God, amen? He gives his children a roadmap into the future. He's almighty. He is omnibenevolent, all-loving, almighty, all-knowing. He knows the future. He tells us history in advance. That's the awesome thing about, there's so many awesome things about the Lord, but one of the things I love about him is his sovereignty, his power, his authority, his, his wisdom, his knowledge, his, and, and that his attributes are absolute, you know? He's not just somewhat love. God is love, Amen. He's not just somewhat holy. He's holy, holy, holy. The Bible says God is spirit. God is light. We, we know a lot about him through his word. But one of the things that strengthens my faith is biblical prophecy. It has a huge effect on your life when you look at it. In fact, God used biblical prophecy uh, to bring me to himself. I came to himself through spiritual warfare, realizing that Satan was very alive and real and cried out to the Lord, but he solidified my faith that he is the one true God, that he is the author of the Bible, that he sent his son, Jesus Christ. Uh, and that, I became convinced more and more of that through the study of biblical prophecy. Actually, it had an, a, a, a profound effect on my life. Uh, millions of people came to Christ in the 70s and 80s through books written on Bible prophecy, like Hal Lindsey's book, The Late Great Planet Earth, and Countdown to Armageddon. Uh, many a testimony. Uh, so, uh, prophecy should affect our lives, not only in bringing us to Christ, but in causing us to live for Christ. Amen? And the decisions that we make on a daily basis should be modified based on the fact that Jesus is coming and that we're going to stand before God and give an account for our lives. Based on the fact that the end is coming, whether it's just through death and you're going to face him, or it's through the cataclysmatic uh, event known as Armageddon, and Christ returns to take us off the planet uh, as he descends to destroy the wicked. Uh, it, it, prophecy should <laughs> have an effect in our lives. Just as a hurricane coming should affect your life if you live in Miami or in Houston. It should have affected their lives. Amen? There's a hurricane of judgment coming uh, that's not likely or most likely, but is inevitable. And we need to make sure we modify our lives in light of what God's Word says. The name of this message is How to Live in the end of days. How to live in the end of days. Uh, and Jesus answered uh, uh, kind of a, a, a two questions, three questions, perhaps if you divide his coming from the end of the age. Really, it's technically speaking, it's two questions. Uh, that he talked about how prior to that, he prophesied many different things, but he, he talked about how they were checking out the temple. They were saying, Jesus, look at the temple. It was one of the seven wonders of the world, the Jewish temple. And they were blown away, saying, Jesus, check out these beautiful stones, you know. One stone could be up to 35 tons, okay. And he said, I tell you that not one of these stones will be standing on another, you know. And that the Romans will take you into all the world, and you'll be taken captive throughout the nations. Israel, he said, would cease to be a nation. And... Less than 40 years after his death, Titus came in, the general, Roman general, and every stone was thrown down in the temple, which the Romans didn't typically do. They typically allowed your religious symbols to stand to a degree. Usually other uh, empires in the past would destroy all the religious symbolism, but because Rome practiced Pax Romana, Roman peace, they thought the best way to take over so many territories and keep peace with uh, the people that we've taken over, is allow them to have some of their culture, some of their religion, as long as they don't contradict the worship of our gods and interfere with us. 
or cause some kind of insurrection. And so it was that they allowed the Jewish temple to stand. So when Jesus gave that prophecy, it wasn't just Israel and the Jews that would, it'd be like just a blow mind that the temple would go down under their power, but since it was under Roman power, and Roman power allowed such structures at times like that and had allowed that temple to stand for decades and decades after, as they were ruling Jerusalem, it just seemed unfathomable. Who was going to do this? Well, the Romans did it. And that, that was an astonishing prophecy. And the thing about biblical prophecy is how accurate it is. But Jesus didn't just, they, you know, they said, you know, what will be the sign of your coming? Not just when will these things be, but what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And if you go to the end of the Olivet Discourse, you'll see that the end of the age is synonymous with his coming. Amen? So it's really kind of one question, a two-pronged question. So you could say three, but two basic questions. And it's interesting because he did say he would return. All these prophecies that talked about his first coming were he'd be born, Bethlehem. How he'd be crucified in between thieves. Where he'd be buried in a rich man's tomb. How he'd be rejected by his own people. The very year of his crucifixion in Daniel, given. All these prophecies were fulfilled quite literally, I'll mind you. His second coming will be fulfilled as well. And just as there were signs for his first coming, and the wise men strolled into Bethlehem because there were signs in the sky, so Jesus said there would be signs of his second coming. In fact, look at Luke chapter 21 and Look at verse 25. There will be signs in the sun. Hmm. Anything going on with the sun lately? Oh, mass, uh, radical eclipse, which by the way, the next eclipse in our country from that eclipse is how many years? Does anybody know? Ooh, interesting. I don't know. Seven years. Uh, Oh, I'm not saying that's a tribulation period. What I'm looking for is not an eclipse. I'm looking for a deal that's made with the many for seven years. But I just, you know, that's interesting. People have been talking about that. It's an interesting thing because a lot's been going on since that eclipse, you know, that just took place. But he said, and I think it's very interesting, there will be signs. It's not just an eclipse that just took place. There's something else that just happened with the sun. The largest solar flare ever recorded. By the way, you read Revelation 16, and it talks about the fire coming off the sun, heat, scorching men, and men blaspheming God because of the pain of their sores. That's true global warming, Mr. Gore. Okay? And I say that somewhat facetiously, but seriously too, because Al Gore will say, the book of Revelation talks about these things. Yeah, the book of Revelation talks about things heating up Mr. Gore because people refuse to repent of their sin and of killing innocent people like babies, you know, which he's for, okay? And pharmacaea and all kinds, and, and sexual immorality and, and all kinds. And the Bible says the earth will reel to and fro like a drunkard because of, and be punished because of her sin. And God will destroy those who are destroying their earth, the earth, and they destroy their earth because of their sin. Oh, that doesn't mean that every kind of, in, that environmental catastrophes and irresponsibilities by huge corporations and industries uh, should escape our notice. You don't want to just jump on the conservative bandwagon and just parrot everything they say either because God, God did give us a stewardship over this earth, amen, as Christians. But at the same time, we don't tap into a progressive liberal agenda and their form of stewardship, which is to worship the earth and put it before Jesus, amen? Jesus needs to be first, but we also need to make sure that we don't uh, pollute the earth and so forth, but that we're stewards as Christians. Christians of all people uh, have, should have the most biblically, should have the most balanced view of being stewards of the earth, amen? Because we recognize that it's creation, not the creator. And the Bible warns about those who will worship the creature rather than the creator. That's because when you worship the creature, you can kind of make your own God and make it in your own image and do what you want to do. And that's why people do that. We need to worship the one true God, but interesting, there will be signs in the sun, 
and moon and stars and on the earth dismay among nations in perplexity at the roaring of the what? Sea and the waves. Any of that going on lately? A lot of that going on lately, amen? Verse 26, men fainting from fear and the expectation of the things which are coming upon the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. There's a shaking going on. And Jesus talked about these signs, not all happening just one time at once, but he described them as being like what? Birth pains. So he let us know these would happen over and over again. You'd be able to go back and say, wow, this happened over here. Wow, this happened back there. Just like a woman having birth pains. Wow, I had these tremors, you know, earlier on in my pregnancy, you know, not too many weeks ago or days ago, right? But what happens with birth pains? They get worse and worse. They become more frequent and more intense. Is that right, ladies? You can speak to this with way more authority than I. I've had a, a few kids, but it was actually, I used my wife's body because we're one flesh, you know? So I, I had the easy way out, you know? But I remember her going through those birth pains. And uh, radical, because all of a sudden they start happening more and more and more and more intense, you know? And then before you know it, you have this beautiful baby. We have these radical birth pains and then they'll stop a while. I remember I was just thinking just a few months ago that, man, I was remembering we were having all those hurricanes and everything. And, well, Lord, we haven't seen those in a while. That's interesting. Bam! Here we are. And then they become more intense. In fact, they say Irma is bigger than all the hurricanes we've already had this year combined. That's radical. Now, and by the way, it's not just Irma. There's hurricanes on the hill like Hosea, Jose, and others of Irma. You know that, right? In fact, my wife uh, was uh, showing me a Facebook post that someone had left uh, that stated this. Just in case you didn't know, California is on fire. This is a few days ago. Oregon is on fire. Washington is on fire. British Columbia is on fire. Alberta is on fire. Montana is on fire. Nova Scotia is on fire. Greece is on fire. Brazil is on fire. Portugal is on fire. Algeria is on fire. Uh, Tunisia is on fire. Greenland is on fire. The Soccer Republic of Russia is on fire. Siberia is on fire. They could have added Wyoming, right, and more. Texas is underwater. India, Nepal, Pakistan, and Bangladesh experience record monsoons and massive death toll. Sierra Leone and Niger experience massive floods, mudslides, and deaths in the thousands. Italy, France, Spain, Switzerland, Hungary, Poland, Romania, Bosnia, Croatia, and Serbia are crushed in the death grip of a triple-digit heat wave dubbed Lucifer. Southern California, that's where we live. It's under sweltering triple-digit heat. In usually chilly August, the city of San Francisco shatters all-time record at 106 degrees, highest ever recorded, while it reaches 115 degrees south of the city. Northern California bakes in triple digits. Lisa and I, when we arrived in Frisco at Friday, that was when it was 106. That was the record date. I thought, wow, I thought Frisco was supposed to have nicer weather than Southern California, you know? Beautiful uh, wedding, by the way, of uh, Kaylee and Austin Hedge. Uh, well, not Hedge anymore, huh? <laughs> Hawk. Uh, beautiful couple. Love the Lord. And uh, it's been great getting together with the uh, married couples and premarital counseling with several of them now. And how many of these couples, all of them that I've counseled, love the Lord? It's awesome. And by the way, Jesus said in the days, it'd be like the days of Noah. People will be given in. Marriage, I'm like, yeah, <laughs> that's still happening. Amidst all this crazy stuff that would be going on, people would be building. People would be marrying still, you know? We'd still be able to be lights to the lost world, amen? Shining who Jesus is, amen? Well, <laughs> 106 degrees. Uh, Yellowstone volcano is hit with earthquake swarm of over 2,300 tremors since June, recording a 4.4 quake on June 15, 2017, and 3.3 shaker on August 21, 2017. 5.3 earthquake rumbles through Idaho. Idaho. Jesus, you said, well, there's always earthquakes. Yeah, but Jesus said in various places, like places you wouldn't expect, you know. 
And they're getting earthquakes in places they don't typically have them right now. Japan earthquake, 6.1, possible tsunami. Mexico earthquake at 8.2, we just had. I say we just had because I feel like we're all one now with Mexico. You know? <laughs> we're part of Mexico, it seems like. Mexico earthquake, 8.2 imminent tsunami. Beach lines are receded at least 50 plus meters. Hurricane Harvey, Irma, biggest ever recorded. Jose and uh, Keisha are barreling around the Atlantic with eight more potentials forming. And last but not least, uh, a CME solar flare last night, the highest recorded solar event ever. And then it says, and now that you are caught up, that's how it ends? Caught up? Like caught up? I mean, I thought that's kind of an interesting uh, a post because it highlights a lot of the crazy things that are going on all over the place. And it's just talking about, you know, what people call natural disasters for the most part. It's not talking about the geopolitical situation. It's not talking about what's going on in the Middle East. It's not talking about what's happening with our country. By the way, I encourage you to see uh, a couple Wednesdays ago, I did a, a message called, Is America Babylon? Part one, I really encourage you to look at that. There's a lot of stuff going on geopolitically. There's a lot of stuff going on spiritually. Uh, this same, this kind of thing, I mean, we got, you know, I don't think in that thing, North Korea was mentioned, you know. Uh, China just saying, hey, if U.S. strikes first, we jump on North Korea's side. We've known that, but they just publicly stated that again. You know, many feeling we might be on the verge of World War III, okay? Some people say, no, Trump is far too mellow of a guy to get involved in that. And that North Korean guy, he's, he's pretty level-headed. Don't worry about this situation. Uh, like, really? Okay. <laughs> no, I don't think anyone's saying that. We need to be praying, though, amen? And concerned, praying for our leaders, amen? Praying for the world leaders. We know where this is headed, though. Well, in the midst of all this craziness, we can praise God because even though he says, uh, here, Jesus, men's hearts will be, they'll, they'll be fading from fear of expectation of things which are coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. When he states that, verse 27, he says, then they will see the what? Son of man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But when these things begin to take place, what does he say? Straighten up and lift your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Turn back now to Isaiah. Now he says to straighten up, not to cower, not to whimper, not to freak out and say it's all over and I have no hope. But you should have greater hope when you see these events take place. Amen? Straighten up and say, my redemption is drawing near. Amen? And he goes on to say a little bit further as he describes more things, that after all these things come to pass, you know that I'm at the door. We're supposed to be watching the signs of the times. And I just found out that my youngest daughter, Heather, ha, uh, is, uh, and Adam, they're here today. Uh, sorry about that. And, oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> they were like shaking their heads. Wow, I'm sorry, guys. Uh, anyway, the cool thing about a baby coming, uh, <laughs> God is so good. Hey, you know what? Since I let Cal in the bag, I am so sorry. I didn't know it was a secret. Can you pray for her and their, their new baby? You know what? They're keeping a secret. So you know what? God takes the bad things. I wasn't supposed to let that out, I guess. God takes the bad things. He turns them into good things. So right now, She's going to have all kinds of prayer support. Amen? Let's pray right now. Father, we lift up Heather and Adam's baby right now to you. And thank you for this precious little child in Jesus' name. And we pray, Father, that it would be healthy and just have a, she'd have a healthy uh, pregnancy and that they'd have a, just a healthy, beautiful baby born, Father. And that you bless them and keep them and cause your face to shine upon all three of them, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I am so sorry, Heather. I am so sorry. I thought I'd see a smile over there, and man, like, ouch. I see like three heads shaking in a row. <laughs> even Mark's head was shaking. He didn't even know, you know. <laughs> but God is good, so we'll get more prayer support, amen? Everything's fine with the baby so far, so keep praying for, it, for the baby. But you know what? The great thing about birth pains, I'm still not out from under the bus, by the way, so pray for me. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I need prayer more. Uh, but anyway, 
Uh, the crazy thing about the birth pains, though, they're intense, they're painful, but the end, the result is a, a beautiful child, amen? The end results of the birth pains our planet is going through is Jesus is coming back. The baby born in Bethlehem, full grown, <laughs> comes back uh, to, to establish his reign on earth, amen? So praise God. Now look at Isaiah chapter 46. Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 and 10. The Lord says uh, in verse 8, Remember this and be assured. The Lord wants to have his assurance. Recall the mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. Declaring what? The end from the what? From the beginning. And from ancient times, things which have not been done. Saying my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my purpose from a far country. Truly, I have spoken. Truly, I will bring it to pass. I have planned it. Surely, I will do it. In fact, it's interesting. In this context, he's talking about rising up a leader who even calls by name Cyrus uh, from Persia that will basically uh, be uh, play a major part in Israel going back into the land, Judah, the kingdom of Judah going back into the land. And it happens, just like God says. And of course, you know the prophecies we've talked about. Israel will cease to be a nation. We just talked about that. Go into all the world, be led into different nations, hated wherever they are brought to, having no place to lay their foot, then being brought back into their own land before the end times in a state of unbelief, which is exactly what's happened in 1948. Amen? May 14, 1948. And he even uses, and I don't have time to get into these prophecies, but we did a, 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 a series of... Uh, Actually, a few messages ago when I said, is Israel Babylon? That was another message a few weeks ago. I go through prophecies that show that Israel, several, will be brought back into the land in a state of unbelief. And God will save them at, on the day of the Lord. All Israel shall be saved, Romans chapter 11. And how they couldn't be Babylon because Babylon is destroyed at the end of the tribulation where Israel is saved. But I mention this to you because specifically in the context of the Lord saying, I, can tell, I tell the end from the beginning, he mentions my nation Israel, and I tell their future in advance. And he distinguishes himself from the false gods throughout Isaiah uh, over and over again, stating that the false gods cannot accurately prophesy. The idols, he makes fun of the idols in Isaiah and other books, saying, you're idols, you know? They have ears, but they can't hear. They have eyes, but they can't see. They're worshiping these, these stone images that they're making because they want to worship gods that they want. And the Bible says the gods and nations are demons. Demons use those things. Demons will use whatever kind of conduit they can, right? And he states that he makes fun of them. I'm sorry. He, he wants them to see how ridiculous and ludicrous it is to worship stones and worship, you know. I mean, t this last week, Lisa and I walked into places that were filled with Buddhist statues and everything else. And I remember seeing Buddhist statues years ago. They were all like, I noticed that they were all like, typically, you know, all very overweight Buddhas. I mean, really round, okay? But I noticed now that I'm in the, we're in the Napa Valley area of Frisco, a lot of people are in health kicks, all the Buddhas are skinny now. <laughs> I was thinking, oh, you know what, okay, Buddha's going to be skinny now, and Okay, that's because that's what they want to, they say, okay, you know, let's, let's have them look good because, you know, uh, we're going to worship this thing. And, and Buddha didn't even push God, you know. He left his wife and child, abandoned them for spiritual discovery. Wow. I don't think God honors that pers personally. He was just another guru, but he had his own spin on what, you know, on his own, a little bit of a different spin on teaching. Uh, but you know what? It's interesting because he says, you even have to carry your gods. They pick up their idols and move them. You have to carry them. God's like, what are you doing? But he also says not to put their trust in their false gods because he says they can't tell you the end from the beginning. They can't give you hope. And he tells them not to put hope in their psychics either. In fact, a little bit later in this chapter, chapter 47, we read this. Verse 12. He states it. Again, sarcastically, this is one of the most sarcastic portions of Scripture here and there because he's letting them know, he's trying to shake them up and wake them up and shame them to turn from their idols because it's, they're going to be destroyed. Stand fast, verse 12. Stand fast now in your spells. 
and in your many sorceries with which you have labored from your youth. Perhaps you will be able to profit. Perhaps you may cause trembling. You are wearied with your many counsels. Let now the astrologers, those who prophesy by the stars, those who predict by the new moons, stand up and save you from what will come upon you. Is he saying to actually do that? No, he's saying, go ahead and do that and you'll see what happens. Because look at the next verse. Behold, they have become like what? Stubble. Fire burns them. They cannot deliver themselves from the power of the flame. There will be no coal to warm by, nor a fire to sit before. So have those become to you with whom you have labored, who have trafficked with you from your youth. Each has wandered in his own way. There is none to save you. These psychics, these astrologers, these tarot card readers, these mediums, these sorcerers, they can't even deliver themselves from the coming judgment. Why are you seeking refuge in them? And this is important because when times of crisis happen, do you know what's happening right now? All kinds of people are calling the psychic hotlines. What's going on here? What does Nostradamus say? By the way, Nostradamus got a lot of things wrong. And his, are, his statements are in such riddle form, you can make them mean almost anything. You know, his quatrains. And I, you can go online and type in Nostradamus, not right now, but you can type in Nostradamus' letter to his son where he warns him, don't get involved in what I'm doing. Don't get involved in, in witchcraft because it will destroy you in the end. By the way, look at Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 8. So one way to live in these times is not seek psychics, not seek mediums, not to seek sorcerers, not to seek those who prognosticate by the stars, astrologers, not to seek false wisdom. Because one of the signs of the end times, Jesus says, is there will be many false Christs and many false what? Prophets. And they will deceive many. So one thing you want to do is stay clear of counterfeit knowledge, of counterfeit wisdom. Counterfeit knowledge tries to puff you up. Satan, to Eve, God knows if you partake of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. But the thing was, <clears throat> hint, hint, uh, you'll be like God. She was deceived. And sometimes knowledge, there, there's bad news that God reveals to us. God's not like the doctor that comes in that doesn't want to make you feel bad and says, oh, take, take this aspirin, you'll feel better even though you're, you've got a serious cancer. God tells us the truth, Amen. He says, this is what's really going on with you, and this is how you deal with it. Not because he's mean, but because he loves us, amen? God really cares about us. He really wants us to understand that he cares about us, and he wants to deliver us from the things that would destroy us. In Isaiah chapter 8, I usually quote this from the King James, but I, we're right here. I want you to look at it. Verse 19, when they say to you, consult the mediums. There's even shows with the term medium in it now mediums, and the spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people consult their who? Their God? Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no what? Because they have no what? They have no dawn, or they have no light, or there's no light in them, King James. You don't go to psychics. You don't go to mediums. And I've had to counsel people through the years, believe it or not, even professing Christians who went through, not a lot, but a couple times, traumatic stuff where they wanted to seek a psychic. I'm like, what are you thinking, <laughs> you know? Not here right now, but in the past. You can't do that. You seek God. You test everything. If they don't speak according to thy word, it's because there's no light in them. We need to be men and women of the word, amen? We need to stand on God's word. The Bible speaks of how no prophecy has ever fallen to the ground. That's figurative language for failed. God's word doesn't fail. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Amen? The Bible says we're supposed to be like the Bereans. I love the Bereans. And Berea there in Acts 17. The apostle Paul and Silas are sharing the gospel with them. And they were like, wait a minute, man. How do we know you're from God? How do we know what you're saying is true? So they went to the Old Testament, and they tested what he said. And they looked at the scriptures, and they said, wait a minute. Let's see if what you're saying about Jesus being the Messiah is true. 
And they said, wow, all these prophecies that you're talking about are right here in the Torah, in the Tanakh. Here they are. And they tested them. And does it say Paul got upset and Silas got really ticked off and said, you know, we should treat us as popes. They'd have popes back then. They wouldn't have a pope for a few hundred years, by the way. And it wasn't the Christian church that had a pope. It was the Roman Empire that had the popes. But they didn't say, hey, you know what? We're speaking ex cathedra. Just believe what we say. No, you know what the Bible says of them when they tested Paul? It says, those in Berea, the Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they searched the scriptures daily. Daily. Are you in the word daily? Be in the word daily. It'll enrich and bless your life. Start your morning off by meditating on God's word. Go to bed with the scripture in your heart. You're like, oh, sometimes I have a hard time sleeping. You know, I just, I, I, I take, you know, I have to take pills or, or drink a little bit. No. By the way, I just looked at a study. Drinking does not help you sleep. It actually makes your sleep worse, okay? Seek Jesus. Seek his word. Go to bed with a scripture on your heart. Memorizing and seeking him in prayer, amen? Rise up with scripture in your heart. It says, the, those in Berea, the Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they searched the scriptures daily to see if what Paul was saying was true. They're considered noble. Paul didn't say, how dare you, I'm an apostle. No, because guess what? All of our lives, anything we say has to be tested by God's word, even if it was by the apostle Paul. And Paul said, if an angel, or even if we bring another gospel to you than that which we preach to you, let him be what? Accursed. Anathema in the Greek, eternally condemned. In the NIV, it just means literally to be cursed. Bad enough, right? So God's word warns about seeking psychics. You know who the most popular psychic has been for New Agers? Uh, for decades. Ever since I was a Christian, Edgar Casey. Remember that guy? He's, if, if you see how many hits are on the internet, just people still looking at his stuff, it's almost like Nostradamus. Uh, but you know what? Edgar Casey, he prophesied that in the 1960s, he said, well, he prophesied way before that. He prophesied his, one of his first prophecies, and he'd go into a trance and get revelations from spirits. And he's prophesied that 1933 will be a good year. That was when the depression hit rock bottom here. That was the year Adolf Hitler became chancellor of Germany. And you know what happened after that? He dissolved the German parliament. Uh, he started the, you know, the Nazis gained control. And the rest is history. But yeah, he said in the, 19, in the 1960s, he said, California will fall into the ocean. I guess we're all just dreaming right now because that did not happen. Uh, crazy stuff, okay? Sylvia Brown. Anybody hear Sylvia Brown? Come on, I see hands going up. How many of you actually sought her counsel? Please don't raise your hand. Oh, man, are you trying to scare me? Okay. Uh, she was a, you know, a psychic to the stars. She was on Montel Will Williams as a regular for almost 20 years, prophesying. Most popular psychic for many, uh, many years. But Sylvia Brown, uh, she prophesied, predicted in 2004 to Lawana Miller, the mother of Amanda Berry. Remember her? She said, she's not alive, honey. Uh, your daughter is not the kind who wouldn't call. Well, in May, right after that prophecy, uh, they, uh, Barry was discovered alive and been held captive by uh, or Ariel Castro for nearly a decade. Sadly, uh, Miller, her mother, had died between the false prophecy and the revelation that she was alive. In, in 2002, Brown prophesied uh, to the missing parents of an 11-year-old, Sean Hornbeck, on the Montel Williams show for the nation to hear uh, that the child was dead and kidnapped by a dark-skinned man with dreadlocks. In 2007, the accused kidnapper, Michael Delvin, who was a Caucasian man with short hair, uh, well, uh, they found out that uh, the kidnapper was a white guy with short hair and the child was found alive. The parents were offered off the Montel Williams show, off camera, if they gave $700 to Brown, 
she'd give her more, they'd give them more extensive details of their child's death, apparently. Well, by the way, Sylvia Brown claims that she has, when, when she was found wrong over and over again, over and over again, you know what her go-to line was? Only God is right all the time. Well, that's not true. Only God is right all the time in one sense, but if he has a true prophet, they're going to be right all the time too, amen? You know what the penalty was if you, were not, if you had a 99% track record? What was the penalty? He'd stone you to death. You could go look at Deuteronomy chapter 18. It talks about if a prophecy doesn't come to pass, you know, you're not to fear that prophet, that wasn't for me. And then elsewhere in Deuteronomy, he says, you're supposed to rock them to sleep, okay? Stone them to death, okay? Uh, that was a penalty. If you got 99 out of, if you got 999 right, and you got just one wrong, you were stoned to death as a false prophet. But by the way, the Skeptical Inquirer magazine looked at her 115 predictions that she made on Montel Williams in their magazine. Guess how many she got right? Zero. Come on, guys. The Lord says, why do you seek these mediums when you can seek the living God? Amen? And Jesus, guess what? His prophecies, I'll die. This is how I'll die. I'll be crucified. Happened. I'll rise again on the third day. Happened. He's alive. Amen? We have a sure word of prophecy, it says in 1 Peter chapter 1. Amen? And God's word is... I hope and pray during these times that you're in God's word. I hope you pray that you're always in God's word. You're supposed to meditate on his word day and night. Amen. It said, the Bible says God's word works effectually in the hearts of those who believe. Man, the, when you're reading God's word, he works in your heart, even in ways that you don't even understand. Amen. You learn to love him more, to fear him more, to want to draw close to him more, of his plans for you, of his, his glory and how he reveals himself. So important. By the way, it's not just these, you know, all these false prophets. Uh, oh, by the way, she prophesied her death. She got that right. She did die, but she said she'd die when she's 88. She died at 77, so she got it wrong, really. Okay. But then you have these scientific prophets, these scientists who tell us, like Al Gore, he's not a scientist, you know, saying this is what's going to happen, and the polar ice caps, da 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 there's a whole list. You can go online and see all the different predictions Al Gore got wrong. Okay. Earth Day. It was Earth Day this year. Not just, what, a couple months ago? Earth Day started in 1970. Celebrated every year now. It's become a bigger and bigger deal because of New Agers and the environmental problems and things of that nature. But for the first few years of Earth Year, in 1970, right away in 1970, they started making all these predictions about the end of the world from a scientific standpoint. Ecologist Kenneth Watt declared, quote, by the year 2000, if present trends continue, we will be using up crude oil at such a rate that there won't be any more crude oil. Uh, you'll drive up to the pump in the year 2000, fill up, say, fill her up, buddy, and he'll say, I'm very sorry, there isn't any. He'd be better off if he say, you go to the pump and you say, fill her up, buddy, and nobody'd be there. You'd have to do it yourself. He would have got it right if he said that. But uh, we've been using crude oil like never before in the last couple of decades, especially with China, uh, you know, getting all their vehicles now and so forth. Oh, will that source run out eventually? Yeah, but he said in the year 2000, this is what's going to happen. Is that what happens to you? It's more likely that I go to the gas station. I'm like, man, don't I have two quarters? <laughs> Got to get some gas, you know. Uh, Paul Elrich confidently declared in April of 1970, quote, the death rate will increase, and this is one of the big pundits, prophetic uh, prediction guys in, in, uh, on the left. The death uh, rate will increase to at least 100 to 200 million people per year. Uh, will be starving to death during the next 10 years. Elrich went on to uh, make this alarming statements that, uh, on, and this was in 1970, Earth Day issue of the Progressive magazine, uh, assuring readers that between 1980 and 1989, that 4 billion people, including 65 million Americans, would perish in the great die-off. Did that happen? Did we miss something? No. He warned Americans born in 1946 or later that their life expectancy will be 49 years uh, old on average in, uh, in America. And, and 
1980, it would reach, if, you live, if you're in 1980, you only live to 42 years old. Uh, well, I have my dad here, thank God, and he's born in 1926, and he's 91 years old in August, just, just a little bit ago, thank the Lord. Uh, January 1970, Life Magazine reported, quote, I like this one, scientists have solid experimental and a theoretical evidence to support the following predictions. In a decade, urban dwellers will have to wear gas masks to survive air pollution. By 1985, air pollution will have reduced the amount of sunlight reaching the earth by one half. What planet do these guys live on, you know? Kath Watt warned about a pending ice age in a speech in 1970, quote, the world has been chilling sharply for about 20 years, he declared. If present trends continue, the world will be about four degrees colder for the global mean temperature in 1990, but 11 degrees colder by the year 2000. This is about twice what, we would t- what it would take to put us into an ice age. Did you guys feel like you were in an ice age last week? What was it? How, how hot did it get here to see me? What's that? 106? See me? 114 in Tarzana, which is close to where Mark lives. Were you mountain biking that day at noon, bro? No? <laughs> I took my mountain bike out about noon, and I was wondering why there was nobody at the trail at all. Usually there's a bunch of cars at that trail I went to, not one. I got out, and I'm like, these guys just can't hack it. Started to get my bike out. I said, I can't either. And I went back <laughs> in my car. <laughs> it was really hot. <laughs> Wow, how about all the predictions about who would become president? In an article in the Washington Post, three different types of psychic readers were polled. An astrologer, a numerologist, and a tarot card reader. I know it sounds like a joke. It's not supposed to be a joke. And they all claimed to, re- and that, the, the tarot card reader claimed to be in touch with the Archangel Michael. And all three said that Hillary would win. New York City-based psychic Jesse Bravos. These are really famous psychics, popular psychics in the psychic world. Uh, uh, who's been uh, appeared in the New York Times and Wall Street Journal and, and MTV. In October of 2016, Bravo was quoted as saying, quote, Hillary's going to win by a major, major number. It's not even going to be a competition. Lifetime TV psychic uh, Michelle White Dove, America's number one psychic after she won America's Psychic Challenge on a competitive reality TV show program, uh, she was also tested on Sixth Sense International. Well, in March 17th of 2016, uh, she stated, quote, both Hillary and Donald Trump are political puppets that will be on stage, uh, and the vote rigging will uh, make it look like a close race, although the final count will be in Hillary's favor. Sadly, no matter how you vote, the deck is stacked for Hillary to win. Wow. Worldwide spread predictions.com. Eric Lay Pink says the spirits informed him that Hillary would win. In May of 2016, he posted, quote, the next U.S. president will be Hillary Clinton. Wow. Just amazing to me. Uh, Mail uh, receives vision, supposedly. Uh, top U.S. psychic stated, quote, most, though not all, which come about uh, from about 15 different students because she has those she's mentoring, and me, indicate that Hillary Clinton will be the next U.S. president. You guys, stick to the word of God, amen? Not only will you be deceived by psychics, but you will be under the judgment of God if you seek them. Because look at what God warned. He warned throughout the scripture not to seek the mediums, not to seek. We can go through a bunch of different scriptures. We can spend the whole time on warnings against psychics and spiritists and necromancers in the Bible. But you have illustrations like King Saul when things got ugly and his kingdom was prophesied to end by a true prophet of God. He tried to make it not happen. He even tried to kill King David. And God's prophecy f- fulfilled. He sought the witch of Endor. And guess what? He was punished and killed because he sought a witch. Okay? Don't, not only with yourself, I mean, don't even read the fortune section or the astrology section of your, your newspapers or your websites, guys. Oh, I just do it for fun. I think it's, it's interesting. I just think, well, maybe. No, don't, don't go there. Why? Why? You can spend that time reading God's word, amen? Meditating on his word and being strengthened and encouraged, amen? <clears throat> That's what God wants us to do. 
wants us to seek his word and not these false prophets. Now, go to Luke chapter 21 again. And here's another thing we need to concentrate. Not only making sure we get the right information, but that we live holy lives. Luke chapter 21. I can't improve and wouldn't dare even to think about attempting to because his word's perfect. On his word, he gives us the best instructions. And in Luke chapter 21, verse 34. Luke chapter 21, verse 34. Jesus says, Be on guard so that your hearts will not be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of life. And that day will not, uh, that, I'm sorry, th- and that, that day will not come on you suddenly like a trap. What does he mean? That day will not come on you suddenly like a trap. He had just been discussing the end of the age, the signs of the stars, and the sun, and the moon, the, the roaring of the waves, all the stuff, kind of stuff we're seeing right now. And he said, remember before that, he says, and the end is not yet. These are the beginning of birth pains when he describes other things. Wars, like today, rumors of wars. We've been in wars since the last, since I can remember, last 20 years it seems like, our nation. You realize that, crazy. I remember when I was younger, we weren't always at war. I was born in 63. There were a lot of years. Most years we weren't at war. No, we've been at war since, you know, last, I don't know how, how long it's been. Kuwait and Afghanistan and in Syria now, and Iran, and, you know, you know, just who knows what's going to happen in the Pacific Theater. But he said these are the beginning of birth pains. They get worse and worse. They mellow out, get more intense, get more frequent, get more intense. And things are getting more and more intense. Just when you think, oh, wow, things have mellowed out. Man, I thought we might be in the end times. <laughs> Whoa, what is going on here? And... I think it's imperative that you and I, all of us as believers, we look to the prophetic word. It says we're supposed to look to the prophetic word as the day dawns, as Christ's coming gets closer and closer. But Jesus said it be, Jesus said when you see a fig tree, you know that summer is near when it begins to bud. It's getting close. Even so, when you see these things coming to pass, you know that the end is near. And This is what I always share with people, I share often. Even if the end doesn't happen in your lifetime, the end will happen at the end of your lifetime. Amen? I never put it like that before. That's actually good. I should write that down. But I I give them that concept, you know? Uh, Even if the end doesn't happen in your lifetime, the end will happen at the, the end of your lifetime, right? When it's over. We all have an end. We all are going to stand before God. Amen? And these pointers should always should remind us that we are huh, mortal, amen? That we need to be right with God. And it's, it's critical that we get the message. Now, it's interesting because he says, be on your guard so that your hearts will not be weighed down with dissipation, overindulgence, and drunkenness, and the worries of life. Jesus talked about the worries of life, things like this that squeeze the word of God out of people to get fixated on the things of this world and the crises and Instead of turning to Jesus, they turn to what here? Dissipation and drunkenness. Alcohol. And that that day would not come on you suddenly like a trap. What day? His second coming. Verse 27. Back up. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory. Verse 28. But when these things begin to take place, straighten up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. That's what we need to do. We need to not be staggering because of alcohol, right? Oh, I'll fix this. I'll get drunk. No, we need to straighten up, man. Be sober-minded. Be looking at Jesus. Amen? That's what we need to be doing. Verse 35, for it will come upon all those who dwell on the face of all the earth. Verse 36, but keep on the alert at all times. Keep on the alert how often? Instead of being drunk, be sober at all times. Oh, yeah, well, this is when you're sober, and this is when you can get a little tipsy. No, drunkenness is forbidden. The Bible says drunkards will not inherit God's kingdom. Don't be deceived. And it says to be alert at all times. Amen? In fact, at night is a lot of times when spirits attack people. Huh, that's not the time to be drunk. That's time to be alert. You put your head in your pillow, you want to be right with God. 
Verse 36, but keep on the alert at all times, praying that you may, not, uh, that you may have, what? Strength to escape all these things. In other words, guess what? It's not escape via rapture, because you don't need strength to be raptured, amen? Because you're just not, you're not like, oh, if I could jump really high. Whew, I can't. No, he's talking about strength to endure things, to go through things, to go through. He just described the tribulation. And he told them when he, they see these things, the end is not yet. He that endures to end will be saved. You'll see this, you'll see that. You'll see the Antichrist sit in the temple of God. Or when you see the Antichrist sit in the temple of God, or the abomination of desolation, flee. You know, he tells them all these different things. And then immediately after the tribulation, Matthew 29, 24, 29 through 31, that's when the Son of Man returns. And the Son of Man returns here, but it's, his second coming at the end of the tribulation is going to be a trap for all kinds of people. Because guess what it's going to be like? The days of Noah. Eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, building, some things will still seem normal on certain parts. You go, wait a minute, why read Revelation, man? All hell breaks loose. Yeah, it does. In certain geographical regions. Other regions, like Babylon, for instance, Babylon, which is a people group that rules over the nations of the earth and is the richest nation on the planet, <laughs> ruling over the Middle Eastern territories, but the Middle East hates it and just tries to destroy her in an hour, that doesn't happen in the tribulation. God says, don't destroy the oil and the wine, the luxurious stuff. Some of that stuff is there till the end of the tribulation, like the days of Noah. Do you understand that? People will be partying, even at the end. Party like it's 1999, right? That's the attitude a lot of people have. So in some respects, it'll be obvious to us, look what's going on. But to people that are under a strong delusion, it says God will give them a strong delusion that they'll believe the lie. They're going to think, who can make war with the Antichrist? And there's going to be all these radical things happening. A third of the planet being killed at one time, a quarter of the planet being killed at another time. In the opposite order I just gave, actually. A lot of people wiped out. You think you'd wake up. But you think a lot of people are waking up with a hurricane? Yeah, some, but guess what? There's a lot of them having hurricane parties right now. Getting drunk. Not heeding the storm warnings. You've heard about that? You know, I was reading about these hurricane parties uh, recently. Governor gives chilling warning that you will not survive in light of people wanting to have hurricane parties. I was reading about how they're showing one store. It still has a lot of things, but guess what? The, aisle, the alcohol aisle is just totally depleted. Gone. Tweets I checked out. One tweet. Guy says, my grandma. She quotes her, eh, the windows are boarded up and we stocked up on booze, so we're partying. If the house goes, we won't feel it. How pathetic. I'm sorry. Come on, Grandma. Help grandson or granddaughter. Be alert. Amen? Especially at a time like that. Amen? Well, I don't have any that live. Well, find one. Find someone to help. If you think that you, you know what I'm saying? That was so sad to read. We won't, I won't feel it. Hmm. And that's why a lot of people drink. They, you're not supposed to deal with your problems with alcohol. Okay? You know, the Bible says that wine is a mocker and strong drink is a brawler. It says not to keep company with those who are wine bibbers. And Proverbs chapter 20, when I read that, it made me think of Proverbs chapter 23, uh, which talks about not feeling things, you know. It says, who has woe, but there's still woe. Who has sorrow? <laughs> who has woe? Who has sorrow? Pain in their lives. Who has contentions? Who has complaining because... Alcohol causes arguments, man. You know? Who has redness of eyes? Who has wounds without cause? They don't know how they got the wounds. And he says, don't stir at wine when it is red. That means undiluted, because they diluted their wine, so it wouldn't get them drunk. Christians need to heed that. Don't stir at wine when it is red, when it when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly, at the last little bite like a serpent and sting like a viper. And it says, it goes on to say that your mind will see strange things and your tongue will utter perverse things. People say terrible things when they've been drinking. Isn't that true? And you will be like one who says, I will make my bed in the middle of the sea. I'll make, I will lay down on the top of a mast. You ever see a mast? A mast is that part of the ship, that boat that goes up. The last place you want to sleep in the middle of the sea, the most dizzying and the most painful place. But what's the response? 
he goes on to say of that person, they, they struck me, but, you know, nothing happened. I didn't become sick. They beat me, but I did not feel it. When shall I awake? I will seek another drink. That's an amazing portion of Scripture. It's saying don't look to alcohol to inebriate yourself, to become numb to what's going on, to become numb to your own conscience, which tells you that you're a sinner and you need to get right with Jesus. Come to Jesus and be cleansed. Amen? Be cleansed and right with God. Be in Christ. Nick read a beautiful portion of Scripture in Romans 8. That in Christ, I mean, we're in Christ. If we're in Jesus, neither height nor depth, nor principality or power, any other creative thing is separate from the love of God, which is in him, amen? He's our refuge in the storm. Like the days of Noah, they had an ark, but there's only one door in. Jesus said, I am the door. If anyone comes in through me, he'll be saved. He is our ark today, amen? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. I remember reading some years ago about a hurricane that hit Christian Pass, or Pass Christian, it's called, Mississippi. Hurricane Camille. Good to see you, by the way, Camille. That's a, that's, that's a different hurricane over there. Get to know her. She's a great lady. <laughs> Italian hurricane. But uh, Hurricane Camille, man, came with a vengeance, and police officer, Chief Perry uh, Peralta, pulled up, talked to about 20 people that didn't want to leave, wanted to party. No, we're going to be okay. We're going to ride it out. In fact, one of them said, if you want to get me out of here, this is my land. You're going to have to arrest me. Couldn't make them leave. They came, we took down their names, though. Came back. All 20 of them were dead after the hurricane party or during the hurricane party. Foolish. By the way, when you drink, the first thing it impairs is the part of your brain that makes judgments. So how do you know you're drinking too much? Well, I'll just use my judgment. You just lost your judgment while you're drinking. And I've had people in this fellowship have to call other people. Breaks my heart. Saying, I'm sorry how I acted at your house. I had too much to drink. You know the best way I found not to drink too much for me? Just don't drink. But it's not a sin if you have a little bit of alcohol and you don't get drunk. I believe that's true. But are you doing that? Oh, and by the way, don't look at wine when it's red. Dilute it. They dilute it radically. Don't have time to get into all the details. But I'll tell you what. We need, as Christians, to be prepared for what's coming. And Jesus warns against dissipation, living for yourself, self-indulgence, living for pleasures, Paul said, instead of loving, loving pleasures more than lovers of God. He warns about drunkenness. He warns about being alert at all times in the end times. In fact, in Matthew 24, go to Matthew 24, we see a similar warning that Jesus gives about the end times. I say this because I love you guys. And I've seen too many, you know what Josiah said to me a couple weeks ago? He's 20, he goes, Dad, I was asked by, you know what I tell people when they ask me why I don't drink? He goes, I've seen my parents counsel, counsel so many people through the years where their lives were destroyed because of drinking. Okay? And Luke, Matthew chapter 24. He's a smart kid. By the way, Camille's hurricane gust, 205 miles per hour that swept through past Mississippi, Christian Mississippi. Matthew chapter 24. When you look at Matthew chapter 24, uh, Go ahead and look at what Jesus said about being ready. Therefore, verse 42, Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. How many want to be drunk when a thief breaks in? For this reason... You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour when you do not think he will. Who then is a faithful and sensible slave 
whom his master put in charge of his household to give them their food at the proper time. Blessed is the slave whom his master finds doing when he comes. Meaning you're doing the word of God. You're serving God. Amen? Truly I say to you that he will put him in charge of all of his possessions. But if the evil slave says in his heart, my master is not coming for a long time and begins to beat his fellow ser- slaves and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him, an hour which he does not know. And he will cut him in what? Pieces. And assign him a place with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That is hell, my brothers and sisters. The good servant, read Luke 12, very similar. Jesus talked about the end of the age there too. And and if the good servant says in his heart, and he becomes a bad servant, I'll come at a time when he's not aware. Same thing. But he says unbelievers there. He gave it a different time than this. He said this more than once to warn them. He warned over and over again, making sure that you are not getting inebriated in the end times. Oh, you say, well, what if it's not the end times? Then I could get drunk. Be not deceived. Drunkards will not enter the kingdom. It's still, it's a different end for you than all the true believers. You know, uh, go to Romans chapter 13. Paul talks about the day of salvation, Christ coming, getting closer. And in Romans 13, look at what he says here. Go to the end of the chapter when you hit Romans uh, 13. (sighs) Near the end, uh, Romans 13, verse 12. The night is almost gone. Because Jesus left, man. Jesus said, receive the light or walk in the light while you have the light. Because the time has come the light will not be here. It'll be night. It'll be too late. Seem to make, become a Christian while it's still light. But now guess what? Jesus has uh, uh, ascended. He's coming back. And we have a spiritual nighttime going on. But the light is still shining through believers. Amen. But he says, the night is almost gone. And the day is near. I mean, the day star. Jesus is coming, right? Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing, that's partying, and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy. In the end times, you ought to be making sure that you're not being promiscuous, that you're not committing adultery. Adulterers will not inherit the kingdom of God. Amen? That you're not filled with strife and jealousy and anger in your heart that others, with others, that your heart's right with God. And what's the, the interesting thing is when your heart's right with God, then your heart will be right with others. Oh, it doesn't mean they'll be right, because their heart might not be right with God. But if your heart's right with God, you're supposed to be at peace with all men as much as it's possible within you, the Bible says. Amen? So you seek the Lord, you seek to become like Jesus, you follow his example, and you rely on his strength to be Christ-like to people and forgive them and love them when you're hurt. Amen? And you'll find great blessing and great success in that. Now, they may, have, they may not want to be right with God. They may not fear God or man, but you're going to be blessed in that because God works everything together for the good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Amen? So we need to make sure that we don't live lives that are full of strife full of, or that have sexual sin. If you're involved in any kind of sexual sin, you need to repent. I just dealt with sexual sin in, a, in a, one of my last messages at some, to some extent, but I want to mention it again because it's mentioned in the text here. Deal with it. Strife, jealousy. Verse 14, but put on what? Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to to its lust. What's the context here? Verse 11. Do this knowing the time that it is already, that, I'm sorry, that is already the hour for you to be awakened from sleep, for now salvation is what? Nearer to us when, than when we first believed. Therefore, he says, put off the deeds of drunkenness. The deeds of, I'm sorry. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Not involved in partying and carousing and sexual sin and strife and jealousy and all those things, guys. We need to put those things away. Those things do not characterize the life of someone who belongs to God. If you're involved in those things, you need to realize that the believer should be marked by the fruit of the Spirit, amen? Which is love and peace and joy and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness and faithfulness and meekness. Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. There's a huge contrast. Are we real Christians? We're going to put our trust in Jesus. We're going to follow Him. We're going to Make sure that he is first in our lives. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Paul talking about the end times again and how to live in light of the times in which we are living right now. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 1. Now it's the times and the epochs, brethren, 
you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night, just like Jesus said. Obviously, Paul had the same second coming at the end of tribulation in mind as Jesus did. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly, like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. That shows me part of the world at the very end will still be saying peace and safety, thinking their plan's going to win, right? But how are we to live? How are we to live, guys? But you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Verse 6, so then let us not sleep as others do. He's talking about sleeping spiritually. Like the ten virgins, ten bridesmaids. Remember, five fell asleep, five stayed awake. The five that fell, they, well, they all actually fell asleep. They all dozed off for a while. But five had enough oil and five didn't, is what I should have said. Five didn't have enough oil. Give us some of your oil. No, if we gave you some of ours, we'll run out too. And five weren't ready for Christ's return. Oil represents the Holy Spirit. They had lamps. The oil lit up the lamps. The lamp represents God's word. Amen? Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light on my path. Like the ten virgins, man, you better have the Holy Spirit and not be filled with drunkenness, but filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen? You better be walking according to the light of God's word, which is inspired by his spirit. Amen? And being alert and being sober-minded. Amen? Because we're supposed to be of the day even when it's nighttime. And we can only do that if we have the light of his word, amen? And that comes from being filled with the Spirit rather than being drunk with alcohol. Verse 6, so then let us not sleep as others, but let us be alert and what? Sober. Verse 7, for those who sleep do their sleeping at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love. And as a helmet, the hope of salvation, keeping your focus on Jesus as a helmet to your mental well-being and your spiritual well-being. Amen? For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, and here he's returning to what he's talking about in the chapter before, that the dead in Christ who are asleep, he says in Christ, will rise first, and those who are alive will be caught up to meet them in the air. Therefore, uh, I'm sorry. Verse, uh, at the end there, of obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 10, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Dead or alive, you're going to be in him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you're also doing. We're supposed to encourage each other with God's truth that Jesus is coming, the dead in Christ will be reunited with us, and that we're to live sober lives in this world. Guys, God's judgment is coming on this world. And it's going to get worse and worse. The baby's going to come, Jesus. Amen. We'll be raised in him. But last pass I want to take you to is 2 Peter. 2 Peter, chapter 3. Verse 7. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. He just talked about how the world was destroyed by a flood. God promised he wouldn't flood the entire earth again. And he's not going to. He gave us the rainbow. But he said next time he destroys the earth, it'll be with fire. And that's what Peter talks about here right after talking about the flood. Verse 8. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. God loves these people, even the ones who are perishing. Okay? Verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. There it is again. They all talked about the same second coming, guys. Not two different second comings or second and third coming. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat. There is real global warming. And the earth and its works will be burned up. Verse 11, since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct, right, and godliness? Verse 12, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning. And the elements will melt with intense heat. 
But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth, amen, in which righteousness dwells. Praise God. New heaven, new earth, we're in righteousness dwells. That's because all those who belong to him have repented and been filled with the Spirit and lived for Jesus, cleansed by the blood, will enter that kingdom. Verse 14, look at this. Therefore, therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless, and blameless. Can a leopard remove his spots? The Bible says no. How can we become spotless? We can't remove our own spots. That only comes through the blood of Jesus Christ. This judgment is inevitable upon the wicked. You can't stop the judgment from coming. I just read where 54,000 people agreed to join together and shoot bullets at the hurricane to stop it. Okay? Their, their statement, I'm, I'm, I'm sure they're thinking, okay, this is just a statement. A Facebook event created by 22-year-old Ryan Edwards called Shoot a, Hurricane, Shoot a Hurricane Irma. Rally those in the path of the storm to show, uh, to show Irma that we shoot first. Well, uh, the guy later on said he was being, you know, sarcastic, but he got about 54,000 people who said they're going to shoot at Hurricane Irma. Uh, a little ple- a cover, co- copy a little tweet from a, a police uh, uh, sheriff, Pasco, uh, Pasco sheriff, who warned, uh, to clarify, he says, do not, in caps, do not shoot weapons. You won't make it turn, uh, <laughs> you won't make it turn around and it will have very dangerous side effects. So you shoot bullets into the, guess where they come, go? They come right back at you. And that's how the world is. They think they could defy God and shake their fists and say, ah, and God's perfect. God never makes a mistake. Do you really think that you're more intelligent than the creator of the universe and you know better than him what's right and wrong? That's, that's ridiculous on its face. Repent of that attitude if you think you know more than God or you're more loving or more righteous than God. You can't be. You're created in his image and we're fallen sinners and we just have a, we're a dim reflection of who he is. You can't defy God. He always wins. Amen? You just got to get in the ark. Yesterday, Lisa and I were driving through the Napa Valley, and I saw a sign that said, uh, for advice, da da da, call Psychic John, you know. And I said, call him, call him, let's call him. And we couldn't get his number fast enough. And then uh, we looked it up, though. I got it. Poor Lisa, he's a great wife, man. And for 15 minutes, I keep looking, put this and put that in, put 707 in there, and finally we found the guy. And I called him up. But closed on Saturdays. I work on Saturdays even when I'm on vacation. I wrote a whole, I wrote a whole book when I was gone, but not on my wife's time when she's sleeping. But anyway, uh, I called him. I got his answer machine, though. And I said, hey, I say this in kindness or love, something like that. And I said, but just want to let you know, I've got a prophecy for you, a prediction that will come to pass. And it's free, I told him, too. And uh, I said, there's good news and bad news. I go, I'm going to give you the bad news first because I want you to hear the good news last, you know. The bad news, I told him, is that Isaiah 8 says that we're not supposed to seek mediums. We're supposed to seek the one true God. We went into that a little bit. And then Isaiah 47 says, you know, that these prognosticators, these prophets and stuff, they can't even deliver themselves from the coming judgment of God, from the flame. I said, these are lies that you're peddling, you know, and you're in a very dangerous, you're not leading people astray, but you're in, under God's judgment. I said it in a loving, as loving as I could, you know, but my wife is telling me, make sure you don't miss the off ramp. You know, it's coming up. Do you have time? And I'm like, you know, by the way, I didn't know exactly where the offer was, but I knew it was coming up. And then uh, I just told him, Revelation 28 says, those who practice magical arts go to the lake of fire. And I said, hey, but I want to tell you the good news. Jesus died for you, man. He loves you. He wants you to be saved. And it only comes through what he did on the cross for you, you know. And I preached the good news of Jesus, you know. And I got off the phone, you know. And, uh, and right when I got off the phone, she goes, Perfect, right here. I go, oh, shh, off the off ramp. Thank you, Jesus, you know. She goes, I can't believe that timing worked out. God knew what was going to happen, amen. These guys need Jesus, amen. Pray for, pray for psychic John, that he become John the Christian, amen. That he'd know Jesus, that he'd be saved, that he wouldn't lead people astray, amen. Pray for all the people that are looking for understanding what's going to happen. And they look to these scientists and these, these worldly people where Jesus said they can't even know where the wind's going to blow. You, we're watching the hurricane. They go, well, it could do this. Oh, now it's headed to Tampa. They keep changing it. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, it's just what Jesus said. The Spirit moves like that, he said. And people don't know where the wind goes, you know. We can chart some of its courses, but it surprises us. 
But it never surprises God, amen? And you being here today doesn't surprise God. He had you here for a reason. And he wants to make sure you know him. And he wants you to know that, yes, judgment is coming. That's the bad news. But the good news is that you could be saved. You can be found in peace in him without spot or blame. Not because you're spotless. We've, we're all to blame. You point at somebody, you got three fingers pointing at yourself. We all have sin, amen? Because Jesus' blood, because he died in your place, because you deserve and I deserve to die because of our crimes against God. That's why we get the death penalty. But he took the death penalty in your place, amen? He died in your place and paid for your sins. All the spots and all the, the ugly wrinkles, spiritually speaking, and, and the, the blame he took upon himself, the innocent one, so you could be forgiven, amen? He died in your place to pay for your sins. And if you accept that reality, that truth, that Jesus died for you and turn to him in repentant faith, you, you turn from a life of rebellion against him and embrace him as your Lord and Savior. You lean on him now. You trust him. The Bible says, whoever believes on him will be saved. Amen? Amen. Put your trust in Jesus and you'll be saved from the coming storm of God's wrath, which will hit every single person who rejects him. Amen? So I encourage you, if you don't know Jesus, embrace him right now as your Lord and Savior. If you know him, continue to be sober-minded, straighten up, and look up, for redemption is drawing near. Amen? Praise God. Let's pass out the cup and the bread. God is so good.